WPSU is your source for Penn State sports, Penn State research, Penn State community. But we can't do it without your support. Make a contribution today and get a DVD of your favorite Penn State show. I do some consulting work on the American feeling in the room was You don't ever say to her that what about the shock when she does this qualify for the services we left. Like more of a community we're trying to back over. doing in autism. Dr. Temple Grandin is a professor of animal science at Colorado State University and a world-renowned designer of livestock handling facilities. She is also autistic perhaps the most accomplished and well-known autistic in the world. Diagnosed with autism in 1950 and unable to talk until she was three and a half years old, the prominent speaker, author, and gifted animal scientist has stunned parents and professionals by her remarkable achievements. Her extraordinary life story will be brought to life in a new HBO movie that chronicles her struggles through high school to the start of Grandin Livestock Handling Systems, the business through which she has designed one half of all livestock handling facilities in the U.S. Temple Grandin is an inspiration for individuals across the autistic spectrum worldwide. Dr. Temple Grandin, welcome to the conversation. It's great to be here. Describe, if you would, what being autistic means to you. How does it feel? Well, when I was a little kid, I had all of the full-blown symptoms of autism. I had no speech, uh, no eye contact. I was very lucky to get very good early educational intervention. I can't emphasize enough. The young autistic two-year-old, the worst thing you can do is nothing. These kids need a lot of one-to-one -one teaching, and I got that. One of the things that really used to bother me, that doesn't bother me so much now, was the sound sensitivity problems. Loud noises hurt my ears like a dentist drill hitting a nerve. Scratchy clothes were like sandpaper on raw nerve endings. Were the sensory problems. There's other uh, children on the spectrum and adults on the spectrum where they can't stand fluorescent lights because they see them flashing on and off like a disc attack. The sensory things were some of the worst things. And then when I got into my teenage years, the teasing was just terrible, absolutely terrible. And the only place I could go where I was not teased was where there were special interests, horseback riding, electronics uh, lab, Thing, things of that sort. In fact, kid call, kids called you tape recorder. Well, and they called me tape recorder because I would kind of just keep repeating the same thing. I had kind of little set phrases I would just repeat and use. Now, the thing is, an autistic person's a bottom-up thinker. It's sort of like my brain, when it starts out, it's like an internet with nothing in it. And then you load more and more and more web pages as I do more and more experiences in. Then I've got more and more phrases I can use, and it's going to be less like a, a tape recorder. And in fact, you say that you have gained so much knowledge over these past 60 years um, that you act less autistic today than you did 10 years ago. That's right. That's absolutely right, because you always keep learning. It's sort of like when you're an autistic person, you never grow up. Every day I'm learning something new. I'm also doing a lot of different things. It's important to get these autistic kids out and have them do stuff. Surprises cause panic. But they, you know, when I was uh, 15 years old, my mother uh, had me go out to my aunt's ranch. I was afraid to go. And she said, well, you have a choice, two weeks or all summer. And I ended up staying there all summer. But if you don't get the kids out and get them exposed to new things, how are they going to find out that they like it? Now, that visit to a ranch was absolutely life-changing. Well, yes, I would have never have gone into my career in livestock if I hadn't gone out to the ranch. And uh, mother believed in getting me out doing things. When I was 13 years old, she had me doing a little seamstress job for two afternoons a week at a lady's house. Uh, when I was in college, I did internships at a research lab and with a summer program for you know children with autism and other uh, disorders. I get, gotta get out and do things, gotta get work experience. I'm seeing too many real smart kids on the spectrum not getting any work experience. Your mother was remarkable, and, and I say that for a number of reasons. One, you were diagnosed uh, in the 1960s. Um, the diagnosis for autism wasn't even, uh, didn't even uh, come about until 1965. Well, actually, it was, the, my, was first taken into the doctor in around 1949, 1950, uh, when I was two, oh, and a half, two and a half years old. And the only things they could work diagnose me for was just make sure I didn't have epilepsy, which I did not, 
make sure I wasn't deaf, and my original diagnosis was brain damage. And then a few years later, I got the autism label um, put on. But of course, back in the 60s, they thought everything was emotional. You know, autism was an emotional disorder, which it's not. It's a developmental disorder, you know, that the child is born with. And your mother at the time was hearing things uh, like the reason for your problems is refrigerator mother. Well, fortunately, I was born like 12 years before all that stuff happened. So when I was a real little kid, uh, she wasn't subjected to any of that stuff. You know, when I got into be a teenager, that's when all that stuff uh, uh, happened. Now, if uh, Fortunately, you know, uh, the, a good doctor in Boston, a neurologist named Bronson Crothers, recommended a great little speech therapy school. Mother hired a nanny who spent hours with me playing turn-taking games. I was also expected to sit down and have three Miss Manners meals. You know, uh, life in the 50s was much more structured, and that, that was really helpful to me. Autism changes uh, family dynamics, and, and siblings often unwittingly forego childhood because they become kind of a second parent. You talked about uh, turn-taking, which is something that you were taught very young with your sister. Um, tell us a little bit about your relationship with your well, sister. Well, it was she was a year and a half younger. I was the oldest. It was taught with things like board games. We had a Parcheesi set, and I had to learn, you know, take my turn shaking the dice, shake the dice fairly. You know, uh, Nanny would get a very great big uh, jump rope where two people swing it. Well, you have to take turns being the swinger. You can't be the jumper just all the time. You know, there's very basic turn-taking things. Um, and she never acted as a parent to me. Uh, the other two children were quite a lot younger, five and six years younger, so we were far enough apart. But obviously, of course, it was difficult for my sister when she was in high school to have a weird older sister. High school, boy, I can tell you, worst part of my life. You talk about uh, never punish sensory problems, um, but also about uh, these mannered dinners and these three meals where you would sit. You weren't allowed to stim during dinner. You weren't allowed to stim uh, during church. How can parents recognize the difference between a behavior problem and a sensory problem? Well, that takes some detective work. First of all, the places where we had the dinners, for the most part, was very quiet. The only problem we had at my grandmother's apartment was she had wooden slat Venetian blinds, and if they all pulled up fast, they went bam, 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 and they realized they'd be careful with the blinds. When the Christmas party got too noisy, I was allowed to, you know, get out of there. You know, Today, there'd be more problems with that. Church was an old-fashioned organ. You know, if it had been an electronic blasted out church like you have today, that would not have worked. Mother did recognize that big, noisy crowds uh, bothered me. You know, if the kid's doing this, obviously, uh, the sound is hurting his ears. Um, places like Walmart and things like that can be a problem uh, due to all the stimulation from the, um, from the fluorescent lights. I mean, some of this is being a, a good detective, but if you're a good detective, you can usually uh, figure it out. Also, sensory problems get a lot worse when the kid's tired or the adult is tired. One in every 150 people today are, are affected by autism. It's, in fact, rare not to know someone who is autistic. And I'm wondering if you believe um, that the incidence is actually on the rise or if we're just getting better at detecting it, at diagnosing autism. Well, the mild end of the spectrum, the Asperger kids, you know, the geeks and the nerds, I mean, there's lots of famous uh, people out in Silicon Valley that are um, probably undiagnosed Asperger's. Uh, they've always been here. And I have seen all kinds of people that are my age, 40, 50, 60, that are undiagnosed Asperger's that have held and kept good jobs. And they've always been here. But I think today they've got more problems because society isn't as structured. You know, kids are not getting the training of those three uh, Miss Manners meals a day. You know, they're, they're not getting the, you know, the rules were the same everywhere, you know, regardless of where I went in the neighborhood. You know, every house had the same the same rules. Um, now, I think there is some uh, more severe forms of autism, especially the regressive kind, where the kid seems to get some language, and then, you know, 18 months, two years of age, they lose it. I think if, 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 if it's gone up, that's where I think it's gone up. I don't think the Asperger's has gone up. I work in a technical field. I mean, I have work colleagues that I know are a mild Asperger, but they've never been um, diagnosed. Now, you talk about language as being uh almost a second language to you? Well, I'm a visual thinker. My mind works like Google for images. Language narrates the pictures I see in my mind. Like when I design equipment, I, uh, I can actually test run it in my head. Now, the thing about the autistic mind, 
or the Asperger mind, it tends to be a specialist mind, good at one thing and bad at something else. We need to build up the skill area. If a child shows he's good in art, then work on building up skills in things like art. You know, my problem was I was good at visual tasks, but I couldn't do algebra. There's a whole bunch of kids out there that cannot do algebra, they can do geometry and trig, and they need to be allowed to do geometry and trig. Another kind of mind is the pattern thinker, the music and math mind. It's like a more abstract kind of visual thinking. They think in patterns. Uh, in my book, uh, Thinking in Pictures, I discuss how I think. Other books like uh, Daniel Tammet's Born on a Blue Day uh, explains how he thinks in patterns. The weak area for these students tends to be uh, writing composition, maybe reading, um, reading. And then there's another specialist mind, the word mind. These kids often love uh, social studies and history, and some of them will make really good journalists, and they are definitely not a visual thinker. You know, there definitely tends to be an area of strength lots of times and an area of weakness, and we've got to really build up the area of strength and think about what's this kid going to do when he grows up, and there's not enough being thought about that. Now, you say you think in pictures, but if you can't picture it, you can't think it. That, that's changed over that's the right. years. That's right. If I can't picture it, no. If I can't picture it, I still cannot think it. So why don't you ask me to think about something that I can't see in a TV studio. Maybe something kind of abstract. A soul. A human soul. Well, when you first said soul, I started seeing some soul uh, music groups. I'm seeing filet of soul now. You know, those are the things that tend to, tend to come up first. And then, because of your life experiences, you know that I'm talking about something different. Yes, I do, but I still have to have a picture. Um, you know, I'm now seeing, you know, some people, you know, different religions have different views of what the soul is, so now I'm seeing things, ceremonies in different religions. You know, people have asked me, uh, you know, I start thinking about religion. A lot of times I like see this Hubble Space Telescope picture of, you know, the big universe. I see no picture, no thought. It's just, it's just that simple. My mind basically is like Google for images. If I can convert any knowledge I can convert to a graphics file, I am going to remember that. But I have to convert it to a graphics file. One day at a book signing, somebody wanted to ask me a really abstract system question. So they asked me, is capitalism a good system? That was the question. So I, how did I start to go about and answer this question? Well, I started making, let's make categories, because I can sort pictures into categories. That's how I think. Okay, I'm going to put the U.S. and Canada and a few other countries in the capitalism file. And then you have capitalistic socialist. I'm going to put Sweden in there, and I'm seeing a school for autistic children I visited there. Okay, then you've got, um, you know, benign dictatorships. So, uh, you know, then you've got uh, nasty dictatorships, and then you've got war and chaos. And I put different countries in each category. So even something like, um, uh, is capitalism a good system, I have to, like, put pictures into categories. And how quickly can you do that, that word association? Yeah, well, I can do it fairly quickly, but it's not, it's not instantaneous. You know, something like that, um, uh, is capitalism a good system? Well, for what? For health care? For jobs? Uh, if you want to make money? Okay, you see there's different categories of is capitalism a good system? See, I cannot think about that totally in the abstract, and I find I'm working on technical things, the normal mind tends to drop out the details. There's been research that shows that, and I've been working with some other scientists on some papers where pigs had to be handled, and oh, they left out the whole thing on how the pigs were handled. You know, the breed of pig and things like that, well, that, that's, that's going to affect the experiment. The part of the research where I really get fussy is the method section. And people tend to, have, you know, they'll put all the method section in for the lab test, but they don't put the method section in on how the animals were handled. That's going to affect the results on the lab test. This, it better be in there. This thinking in pictures, you say, is the way animals think, the way animals navigate their world. Animals have to think that way. I talk about that in my book, uh, Animals and Translation. Animals and a lot of people with autism, it's sensory-based thinking. It's not word-based thinking. Okay, a dog's going to think in pictures. He's going to think in smells. Think about all the different things that the dog can smell on the local fire hydrant. He knows who's been there, when they were there, their friend or foe, how long ago they were there. There's a lot of information there. Or you can be an auditory thinker, where you're not thinking in language, you're thinking in sounds. See, if you want to understand animals, you've got to get away from language. In fact, the way the brain's set up, it's like you've got the frontal cortex, that's like the chief executive officer, then language is the division vice presidents in the big 
corporate office building that I'm visualizing. Underneath that, you've got like the graphics department, the math department. You've got different specialized sensory-based things. And in the case of your brain, the, the trunk line, the CEO, you say, based literally on, on MRI scans, is enormous, but what's missing are the connections, the communications uh, well, to the I different departments. Well, what, that the tends, way you what, it? what tends to be, what happens in autism is the brain has two kinds of matter, gray matter and white matter. Gray matter is like a processor units. White matter, which is half of the human brain, is the interconnector circuits between different brain departments. Now, in autism, the general trend is for the frontal cortex, which is the brain's uh, chief executive officer, has less interdepartmental connections. But then down the techie department, where you might have graphics and math, that may actually have extra extra connections. That might account for some of the savant skills. Now, of course, it's very, very variable. Then you get into somebody that remains nonverbal. Well, there's all kinds of problems with the sensory input coming in from the outside. The ears and eyes are fine, but the wiring that inside the brain is all messed up, and that has to do with white matter connections. And that's what a lot of the research is showing now. But it's tremendously, tremendously variable. You've mentioned Google several times, and, and you say that we're all sort of gaga over these, these virtual reality computer systems, but to you, they look like a crude cartoon, you say. Well, I've had a virtual reality computer system in my brain, and I, I used to think, I can remember in the 70s when I first started designing equipment, I used to go, how could those other engineers be so stupid? Couldn't they see if they designed a piece of equipment that way, they would pull all the tracks out of the ceiling, it couldn't possibly work, it would just be a disaster. And then I finally learned when I wrote Thinking in Pictures, I, I started interviewing people about how they thought. And I found out that, okay, other designers might be able to visualize, but they can't put it into motion. And I started asking very, very, very detailed questions about how, uh, how they think about things. See, for me, if I can't make my thinking's photorealistic pictures, where somebody that is a music and math mind, they think in patterns. It's patterns. Think extreme origami. You fold a paper to make a beautiful uh, figure, and there's hundreds of folds. That's pattern thinking. It's not my kind of thinking. It's a different kind of specialized thinking. One half of the livestock handling systems in the U.S. today were designed by you. Tell us a little bit about the difference between how they worked then and how they work now. What changes have you instituted? Well, um, first of all, it's half the cattle or handling equipment I designed. I did not design half of all the systems out on small ranches. One of the things I did was put entire systems together. When I started out in the 70s, I'd go around all these feed yards around in Arizona, handle cattle, and one place might have a very nice curved uh, vaccinating chute. Now, the, the, the loading ramp might be really nice, but the sorting pens were horrible. So what I went around, I took all the good bits and put them together into new systems, you know, making the whole thing into systems. Uh, curved chutes have actually been around from uh, before I started, but I figured out the rules for how to lay them out because some of these systems worked well, others didn't. And it was this detail-oriented uh, aspect of how you think that you were able to see things that were overlooked by others. Well, the other thing that people overlooked, okay, the cattle refused to go up a chute. They just want to beat them more and put bigger electric prod on them. Well, I was one of the first people to get down the chutes and go, hey, this animal's afraid of a shadow. Okay, see how there's a reflection on this cup? Well, you can have a reflection on water or on shiny metal. They're afraid of that. Maybe the sun's going in their eyes. Maybe it's too dark. There's a piece of rope hanging across it. There's a shirt on the fence, and that's... Uh, that's scary. Animals notice little details that we tend to not notice. And it's hard to get people to recognize the importance of details. I mean, I guess that's going to give me job security. I just went into a plant just the other day, and, and um, people were standing in front of the chute where the cattle um, could see them, and they wouldn't um, come up the chute. It's like they don't see it. I said, look, you got air hissing all over the place. you got all this like, ropes and junk over the top of the chute. you got a backstop gate in here that weighs a ton. The cattle bump their backs on this other door. I mean, you've got to fix that stuff. You know, it's like, it's a whole lot of little details. People just don't see it. I have checklists for people. You know, but that, you know, and I'm really beginning to see more and more and more that people that think verbally, okay, like let's say we're trying to solve a problem with cattle handling or something, they go into this big risk analysis thing. 
You see, for me, that's like a bunch of verbal BS. But after watching a whole program on that at our American Meat Institute meeting um, last February, I thought this is a verbal way of trying of visual thinking. It's the only way that if you do it totally verbally that they can do it. Now, you, you mentioned this ability to test run equipment in your brain so you can avoid a lot of the mistakes that, that, that others uh, might make. And in fact, you were talking about this track that came down, but you, you, knew that the, you knew from experience that this system wasn't going to work, and in fact it didn't. But I'm wondering how the men on the ground, because we're talking about a, a livestock industry which is male dominated, how did they respond to this A, woman coming in, and B, a woman who has autism? Well, they had a lot of problems with that, but one of the things that stopped a lot of that is when I pulled out my drawings, they look at my drawings. A person with autism that's kind of socially inept has to sell their work. I always worked on selling my work. How did I sell my work to some of the biggest meat companies? I made a beautiful portfolio, photographs of some of my other jobs, some drawings, lists of references. You don't put too much junk in a portfolio. You want something where you open it up and it's wow. Okay, let's say it's a student. You might put in high test scores. You might put in a page of mathematical formulas. You want, um, or some code they'd written, or some statistics they'd done, but you want something where that busy manager can just open it up and in 30 seconds he goes, wow, this person is good. People make the mistake of putting too much junk in a portfolio and having it too messy. And in my book, Developing Talents, that's my employment book, got all kinds of tips on um, how to sell yourself through selling your work. And I try to avoid all the interview stuff. I don't, you know, HR, they don't appreciate good techie, but. I want to talk more about the developing talents, careers for individuals with Asperger's syndrome and, and high functioning autism in, in just a moment. But tell us a little bit about um, sexism that you encountered and different problems that you encountered when you were first in, in feedlots and, and in livestock situations. Oh, I had terrible problems with that. In fact, Claire Danes is going to be in a movie about me when I got my business started. And, and uh, I went out to a feed yard and they put bull testicles all over my truck. Uh, I was taken on grossness tours of meat plants and things like this. I mean, the stuff that people are suing about now for sexual discrimination, that was nothing compared to what I went through. What I had learned, I just had to you know, dish it right back to the guys. And um, I can't tell you all the ways uh, on TV, the things I said, because some of it was pretty gross and pretty crude. But uh, that backed them off really, really fast. Uh, you mentioned Claire Danes, who will be portraying you in your in your twenties, um, uh, yeah, teenage, teenage teenage years and twenties, and she's not going to look or sound like Claire Danes. In fact, your assistant said that her portrayal of you is so accurate that it sent uh, chills down his spine. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it, it was like I went to visit the set. It was like going back on a weird uh, a weird uh, time machine. It's my main reason for going back to it was make sure all the cattle stuff was done right. Like you gotta use Angus cattle, not Holsteins, things like that. <laughs> but, but it must have been a little bit surreal for you because they actually went back to your uh, University of Arizona uh, dorm room or the recreation well, of it. Well, they which recreated had... a dorm room. I mean, that was really weird. I gave them all these pictures from high school and they recreated my old dorm room. <laughs> did you did you relive some of? Because you talked about this agonizingly unhappy teen years. Did it, in a way, did you have to relive it by no, seeing it again? but the teasing, that was the worst thing. And I'd get angry and I got kicked out of, out of a large girl's school for throwing a book at a girl who called me a retard. And one of the things I had to do is I had to switch from anger to crying. I had difficulty modulating emotions, so I just had to switch. And I've had parents say to me, well, my boy cries, that's not manly. I said, he thankfully cries. Crybabies can keep employment. People that get angry do not keep employment. And yeah, I had a lot of problems with meat plants, and I had secret places I'd go hide and cry, like electrical room, one of my favorite places. Got a sign on the door to keep everybody else out. <laughs> this developing talents careers for individuals in Asperger's syndrome and, and high functioning autism is a, uh, uh, one of the books you've written. How do you divide your time between um, your work in the in the livestock industry and helping other people with autism? Well, I try to keep autism right about at a third of what I do. I think it's important for me to keep having my real job as a college professor, doing consulting with the livestock industry, I and mean, I really like doing that. But I think that I think it's important I'm a better role model if I still keep doing my regular employment. I mean, I plan to, you know, be a professor at CSU and 
as long as I can still function. How do you respond to people who look at you and look at the remarkable achievements that you've made and say, she couldn't have been that autistic? Well, I was very autistic. I mean, when I was two and a half, three years old, I had no language. I would just sit and scream, I rocked. And the one thing that made my mother realize that she could do something with me, that when she was playing the piano, she was playing Bach on the piano, I was humming at the Bach. And no, I was a severely autistic uh, little kid with all of the full-blown symptoms of classic autism, you know, the classic canner type autism. And in fact, doctors at the time suggested that you be institutionalized. Well, that's what they did with, you know, kids. I mean, I was also, you know, they thought I was mentally retarded and, you know, you know, mother had to fight to keep me out of an institution. Uh, but, you know, I had really good early therapy. I went to a small um, private elementary school. It was a normal school. Small classes, small, old-fashioned, structured classes, you know, where every, we would, we'd spend half an hour doing the arithmetic workbooks. Then we'd have reading class and everybody, there was 12 kids in the class, take turns reading old-fashioned structured class, you know, then we'd have to write a little paper about our Christmas vacation and the teacher would red mark it all up and then we had to correct the grammar. You know, I, they, uh, I'm really kind of horrified today on the poor writing skills and I'm, I'm not talking about handwriting, but writing composition skills of some college students today. Your mother was an actress and a singer. Um, she, she wasn't an educator and yet she intuitively knew sort of what you needed? Well, I think the thing is, and some of this may be an era thing, I mean, there was a, you know, back in the 50s, I mean, kids went outside, they played, I mean, you figured out how to do things. I think today, kids' life's almost too structured. They don't have to problem solve. I mean, like when I was a child, um, with all the neighborhood kids, we had a sleep ad. Well, here we were, like in fifth grade, and uh, the parents didn't come out and help us put up the old army tent. They let us put it up ourselves. And did we put it up right? No. You know, had the wrong kind of sleeping bag, froze to death. We spent all this time buying all this pop and candy and things like that, and spilling it all over the place. But it was something that we had to plan for ourselves. And kids are doing less of that. You know, I'm, I've talked to some of our professors in animal science about, about pro students' problem-solving skills. And uh, Dr. Engel, who's a nutrition professor, told me something I thought was really shocking. We have a class on, you know, making feed rations and balancing rations. And there's a computer program where you type in your feed ingredients and it'll give you a balanced ration. Well, Terry Engel decided to give them a really goofy set of, of ingredients. So it would come out with a really crazy ration that was 50% salt. Well, who would feed anything 50% salt? Well, 10 years ago, just, you know, most of the classes go, well, this is totally wrong. There's something wrong with the program. You can't. And they wouldn't do it. And they obviously, well, it never got to the point where, it was, where anyone was feeding anything. This was a homework assignment. Right. And, but today, and he did that assignment, uh, he says, great, most of the, the students did not say, hey, this is wrong. And, and now the program, you can't fool the program anymore, so you can't do that assignment. But he deliberately wanted to see how many students would catch the, that this ration that it made was absolutely ridiculous. The critical thinking was missing. The critical thinking part was missing. And then, uh, in, and I found in my class, um, you know, problem solving skills, um, I, I'm worried about um, not teaching enough problem solving skills. So I started a new thing in my livestock handling class where I'm having my students um, pick out a subject that's narrow and look it up in the scientific databases. And I got to teach them how to dig into the internet. Don't just do the first page of hits. You're going to have to go further into it than that. What do you see as the advantages of your autism? Because you once said that if you could snap your fingers and be uh, non-autistic, you would not do that because uh, being autistic is part of who you are. Well, I like my detailed, precise way of thinking. Uh, I'm not going to discuss any political things because people get way too emotional over that. So much of the stuff that goes on in politics to me is just totally irrational. I'm, you know, I'm learning more and more you know, how much sometimes emotion makes people make decisions that I think are extremely stupid uh, decisions. I like uh, my precise way of thinking and I don't want to change that. Now the problem with my way of thinking is I didn't think I could really th that I really could think that good until I was 40 and 50 years old when I've loaded enough information into my mind. See, my thinking's bottom up. It's sort of like you start out with an empty internet and I fill up my head full of more and more and more experiences and web pages that I can then surf inside my own mind to figure out a new situation. 
It's a CD-ROM that you can retrieve, it sounds, right. at, at, at will. That's right, because my mind inside my head works just like an internet search engine. But when I was in high school, I used all these door symbols to think about my future because I didn't have enough experiences in my head to surf. Because if I don't have a visual image, I can't even think. In fact, graduating from high school was visualized for you by going through a door. That's right. And I had to visualize it that way because there was nothing else to visualize. Now, I don't do door symbols anymore because I've got so many life experiences now. Which really sort of underscores the importance for parents of children who are somewhere on the autism spectrum to ensure that they get experiences. And so often I, I know of a number of families where the autistic child does very little. The family almost operates as two units. Mom, dad, and the other siblings go do things and one parent stays home with the autistic child. And so the experiences for that child are very limited. Well, and I think that's really bad. And when I was a very young kid, five and six years old, we went out to some very nice restaurants. Now, for one thing back in the 50s, restaurants were quieter. And I usually behaved. In church, I usually behaved. I mean, it, there was some expectations for behavior. Now, of course, the world was less sensory overload back there. The restaurants were easier to tolerate. Uh, you know, today I'd recommend, well, don't go to a noisy one then. There are plenty of places that aren't noisy or go when it's not busy. But most of the time, you know, when the family went out and did stuff, I did it too. You mentioned a moment ago uh, emotions, and, and you were talking about political uh, politics are, are too emotional. You once said that your primary emotion was fear. That's right. And that's, uh, you know, when I got into puberty, I started having nonstop panic attacks. It was terrible. I mean, imagine what it would be like first time you did your big, big audition or auditioning to get this job. Just imagine if you felt like audition nerves all the time, or let's say we just filled the studio up full of poisonous snakes and the doors were locked. Uh, you know, how, you know, vigilant, oh, oh, is it underneath there? Oh, is it over there? Is it going to come out from under that camera? Uh, you know, that's the way my nervous system was all the time. It was completely, completely terrible. And as I went through my 20s, my anxiety got worse. What I'm observing, and I don't have any really data, but just sort of anecdotally observing, is us visual thinkers tend to have a lot of problems with anxiety. I've been on antidepressant medication ever since uh, my early 30s, and I wouldn't be here without it. And then there's other people that don't need medication, but sometimes a little bit of a drug like Prozac, a very, very low dose, can stop this terrible anxiety. And I want to emphasize, really low dose. The mistake that's made is a um, little low dose works fine, so the doctor ups it, and then the person gets all agitated and can't sleep. And this is all described in detail in my book, um, Thinking in Pictures. Uh, but the, this constant fear all the time, it was, it was just absolutely terrible. And then some of the kids that are more the word thinkers, they seem to be a whole lot calmer. This is a, a spectrum disorder, and one of the things you talk about in all of your books is, is the variability and how important it is uh, that the assessment, that, that there be individual assessment for each child. Well, and I can't wait until we can get assessment on exactly where the sensory problems is, because one child will have a lot of problems with a flicker of fluorescent lights, problems with the visual system malfunctioning inside the brain. Another child is sound sensitivity. Another child is sen it's touch sensitivity. Another one, it's uh, the certain smells they just can't uh, tolerate. You know, and just now scientists are starting to do research on this. Why is it taking so long? I've been talking about sensory problems for years. Well, I think it's hard for normal people to imagine an alternate reality where a fluorescent light doesn't bother them would really bother the, the person on the spectrum. Also, these sensory issues are not confined just to autism. Kids with dyslexia, ADHD, learning problems, and many other labels also have got some of these uh, sensory problems. You mentioned normal people, and, and sometimes those with autism refer to uh, the rest of the population as neurotypicals. I wonder from your perspective, though, is there too much focus on a cure on, on fixing autism? Well, you don't want to just um, make an Asperger totally normal. You will, we could just wouldn't even have a TV studio if it wasn't for uh, people on the spectrum to uh, invent uh, TV equipment and those sorts of things. Uh, you know, it'd be a you know, very boring yakety yak yak social world if you did that. Uh, I think we need to be working on you know, better treatments for the sensory problems because some of the most debilitating things that interfere with socializing at work are the sensory issues. How can you socialize 
if you can't stand to be in the restaurant because of the flickering of fluorescent lights or the racket that's in, in the, the restaurant, or you can't tolerate a normal office environment, how are you going to work? Uh, you know, we've got to find you know, better treatments for those sorts of things. Uh, and what, what restaurant today doesn't have 10 or 11 television monitors? Well, what I find all the television monitors is I can't stop looking at them. You know, that's, um, I can deal with the television monitors, but there'd be other people where that would, um, would bother them. When, in what setting, is uh, Temple Grandin most comfortable? Most yourself? Well, I really like um, sitting down with other people and figure out how to design something, you know, talking about animal behavior, figuring out how to kind of solve problems. I really, really like, like doing that. And that's something that I'm good at doing. You talked uh, about uh, careers and how difficult it is for those on the spectrum to find meaningful employment. And, and the key seems to be figuring out what you're good at and emphasizing the ability rather than the disability. Tell us a little bit about, or I guess I'm wondering what advice would you give to parents about finding a child on the spectrum, employment, getting all them right, moving in the right direction. First of all, direction. what are we going to do? I think when, when a child's like, you know, 10 or 12 years old, they better get my, you know, developing talents book or one of the other employment books. Let's start teaching work skills early. When I was 13 years old, I worked for Seamstress. Okay, or maybe a child that's uh, 12 years old, you can start walking dogs for the neighbors. Got to walk them every day. Kids have to be taught to be on time. That was taught to me when I was, you know, five years old. My mother got an alarm clock. I was expected to use it. Uh, we've, uh, I think kids in high school need to be doing job things. You know, there are, unfortunately, there's some people that think, well, all they can do is bag groceries the rest of their life. Well, a summer bagging groceries is probably some good job experience, you know, then we're going to go on to something else. Mother was always working to get me into job experiences. Another thing the child's got to learn is doing something for somebody else. Like when I was a really young child, all I wanted to do was draw horses all the time. Well, I was encouraged to draw some pictures of maybe a beach or something else that somebody else wanted. Or if you get a child into a robotics class or something like that, they got to learn how to make a robot that doesn't assign the task. You know, I was, um, when I was in high school, messing around, I took care of the horse barn. I cleaned all the horse stalls. I fed the horses. I uh, rebuilt the ski towel house to make it look nice. And these were tasks that other people wanted and appreciated. And, we need, and I'm seeing smart Asperger's graduating from college, and they've never delivered a paper. They've never um, walked a dog. They've never mowed a lawn. I think that's just ridiculous. We need to start teaching work skills as early as possible. What accommodations, if any, did you have getting through uh, your undergraduate degree and then your, your graduate studies? Well, I couldn't do algebra. And thank goodness in the 60s, when I had to take college math, it was finite math. Matrices, statistics, and probability. Because if I'd had to take algebra, that would have been a disaster. I know right now of a boy that can't graduate from high school because he failed algebra and he's taking college physics and getting straight A's. Algebra, I'm sorry, is not the prerequisite for, for some forms of higher math that are more the pattern um, kind of thinking. Uh, so I, luckily, um, I, I had to be tutored in math, but I was able to get through it. Uh, my other classes, like English, biology, uh, psychology, I did just fine in those classes. Also, I'd been taught things like, I had some rules, like one question, one or two questions per class. You know, so I wasn't monopolizing and interrupting classes. Uh, one thing I absolutely cannot do is multitask. You know, some entry-level jobs like waitress in a super busy restaurant, I'd have problems with that. I also cannot remember long strings of verbal instructions. You know, I need to get my instructions, and I've got to write it down. Otherwise, I don't uh, remember the sequence. You know, when I was working on getting my PhD, I had to, you know, again, I had to be tutored in statistics. I mean, that was uh, really hard for me. And then there were other classes that weren't hard at all. I, I would recommend for a number of people going to college to maybe take a lighter load, maybe not take a full load. The other thing that was a big problem for me in college, much worse than the schoolwork, was dorm life. I got stuck in a room with two other roommates. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't study. You know, I need to have a quiet place to go study. And for some students, that's going to mean having a private room. The dorm life actually was a lot harder than the schoolwork part of it. You created um, 
uh, a squeeze chute that's used in the cattle industry, something that you actually used yourself because it was it was comforting. And and you were told, and, and experts said you shouldn't be doing that, and a mentor said to you, well, why don't you figure out why it makes you feel comfort and relaxed? Well, and then I read a lots and lots and lots of scientific literature. And you see, again, he used that as a way to motivate me to study. So if you want to really find out how the squeeze machine works, you've got to study all this stuff about sensory interaction, how stimulus in one sense affects how another sense works. Back in the uh, 70s, there was a whole field of sensory interaction. I still have three notebooks of journal articles that I looked up on that. He taught me how to use the scientific uh, library. I had to learn that Encyclopedia Britannica, that is not uh, where scientists go to get their information. <laughs> I, you know, you you know, good teacher can really make the difference. And I'm finding in a lot of students where they've been successful, and when I look at a lot of the old Aspergers that are around, I've talked to a lot of them about how they got started. There was a teacher that got them interested. They almost got kind of apprenticed into their jobs. Another thing I think is important is the slow transition from the world of school to the world of work. When I was out getting my master's degree, it took a long time to do that. While I was getting the master's degree, I also was uh, writing for the Arizona Farmer Ranchman magazine. I was working at a feedlot construction company. You know, slowly transfer from the world, very structured school into the world of work. You know, not try to go boom, end of high school or end of college, boom, work. Let's try to make that a more gradual transition. Your books, two of them actually have become New York, Time, uh, uh, New York Times bestsellers. They were written um, with co-author Katherine Johnson. I'm talking about uh, Animals in Translation and Animals Make Us Human. Explain how you worked with her, with a co-author. Well, basically, on the Animals in Translation, we did hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of phone interviews. I mean hours. I added up all the time we were on the phone. It would have been two or three weeks on the phone on, in eight hour. You know, you and they were usually one hour and three hour increments. You know, increments. And then I'd send her a lot of references and journal articles or tell her where to look them up on the Internet. Um, you know, that's basically how we did it. And, and why did you need a co-author? One of the problems is, is I have problems with organization. And I've learned, I've learned, like, Thinking in Pictures, my book, Thinking in Pictures, uh, I did not have a co-author on that. And then I have some, um, you know, more academic things I've written. My academic papers, you can look up on the, on the grandon.com. Uh, those do not have a co-author. What I've learned is I have problems with the structure and not rambling. And to, to not ramble, I have to make an outline of what I'm going to discuss and no more than two double-spaced pages before I go to another heading, because I tend to ramble, you know. And then when we did um, Animals Make Us Human, um, Catherine would, did a rough draft, like, for example, on the cattle chapter, did a rough draft, and I added a lot more things. But I now had the structure. See, this is the thing that's a problem with visual thinking. It's not linear. It's associative thinking. Also, the way Catherine writes to make it sound like my voice, I don't know how to do that. If you look at read thinking in pictures, uh, you know, I think it's clearly written, but that's sort of more how I, how I write. It's uh, more sort of technical, but I'm a big believer in clear writing. One thing I'm always after my students is to get all the scientific jargon out. No, we're not going to negatively correlate anything. Come on, now say it in clear language what it is. I, I want to get back for a moment to, uh, to the uh, squeeze chute. Okay. Um, which was developed, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, uh, you helped refine this uh, so that cattle would be calm when they were being vaccinated and, and, and different things. Um, and it's something you had one actually made that you have in your house. Tell, tell us about it, well, what purpose Well, when it I was uh, 15 years old, I watched cattle going through a squeeze chute, a piece of equipment where they put the cattle in, metal side squeeze them, hold them still for vaccinations. And I noticed that some of the cattle kind of relaxed. So I went and tried the cattle chute, and I found that that pressure was coming. Some people on the autism spectrum are attracted to deep pressure over big parts of the body because it calms them down. So I built a squeezing machine that was padded that I could get into that worked similar to a cattle chute to help calm me down. Now, I've talked to other people and have figured out some other ways to calm themselves down. One lady took a 25-pound sack of dog food and would lay it on top of herself. That's probably a little cheaper and less expensive <laughs> than a squeeze machine. Uh, with little kids, you can um, do things like um, beanbag chairs, 
little kid, 25 pound bag of dog food would be way too heavy, but you know, bean bag chairs, wrapping up in, you know, wrestling mats. Um, you know, occupational therapists learned, you know, that things like deep pressure's calming, slow swinging is calming in a net swing, sitting on a ball, doing balancing activities. Uh, if you do these activities at the same time, you may be doing some speech therapy or you're doing some behavior therapy, it sometimes helps to open up the communication line. You know, a lot of these um, kids, all the sensory problems are scrambled up. Their ears are like a bad cell phone connection. And you do maybe the deep pressure, it calms the brain down enough so that the, the cell phone connection is kind of a little bit better. The way animals are, are slaughtered in this country um, uh, has in, been improved because of, of your work. I'm wondering where are we when it comes to uh, the livestock industry. What more needs to be done and, and in what areas do you think we're getting it right now? Well, of all the animals, uh, cattle probably has uh, got the best life. I mean, the cows and the bulls have always been free range out there. Calves are free range for at least half their life before they go into a feedlot. Uh, when I first started in the industry in the 70s, handling of cattle was absolutely atrocious. I talk about this in my book, um, Animals Make Us Human. I've worked hard for the last 35 years to improve cattle handling, and it's, and it's definitely um, gotten better. One of the things I learned is people were much more willing to buy the thing, like the new fancy cattle handling system. Much more want that a lot more than they wanted the management of just understanding cattle behavior. And I, and I found I sold twice as many uh, corral design books as I did videos just on how to handle cattle. And, and too often times people just want the well, magic cure you know, a magic pill, a magic computer, or something that's uh, then just doing the details. Good management is a whole lot of details. You need both the good equipment and the, uh, and, and the good management. You know, some of the animals that have the most problems are some of the intensively raised animals, especially egg layer chickens. That's an area where there's problems that still need to be, need to be corrected. You know, but in, in, um, in the late 90s, I worked with McDonald's and Wendy's on auditing slaughter plants and with a numerical scoring system where I count well, how many cattle vocalized and mooed, how many cattle Which fell down. Which would be down. a sign that they're stressed. Well, yeah, they're bellowing their heads off. Yeah, they're stressed, that's for sure. And, and uh, you know, that's resulted in some improvements. You said no magic cure and that and the people in the industry were looking for this, this magic bullet. The same applies to, to autism. Oh yeah, definitely. No, they want the magic drug, the magic treatment. You know, little kids with autism, it's lots of hours of intensive therapy with a really, really good, um, really good teacher. Now there's a lot of things that will help, but too often um, they're looking for the magic treatment. The other thing I find, like with my livestock clients, I go out to an existing plant, one that would be pretty hard to justify tearing up all the equipment, and the first thing they can think about is tearing up all the equipment rather than finding the details that may be causing the problem, like, like the people standing in front of the chute. What in the livestock uh, industry, or do you still want to change? Still, you, you mentioned that for laying hens and, and, and certain animals and uh, conditions have not improved to, to the extent that you'd like them to, but what are you itching to do? Well, one of the things is still, you know, getting people to just to handle animals right. Uh, so you've got two kinds of issues in animal welfare. You've got things that are just out and out abusive, and most problems you have with cattle handling, that would get into the abusive category. And then you've got questions about, well, how we should house them. You know, okay, chickens in cages versus chickens not in cages. And uh, the other big concern I have, one of my biggest concerns is genetically what we're doing to animals. We've been breeding animals, and this includes dogs too. Dog people don't get out of this. Breed dogs with stupid appearance traits. You breed uh, food producing animals just to grow, 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 milk, 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 milk. And you start to get all these lameness problems. Uh, the longevity problems, they don't live very long, uh, more susceptible to disease. Um, I'm very, very concerned about these sort of things. I think there's things like optimal level of production. But the problem is people just go sort of single trait selection and they don't see the problem, they got a terrible problem. Like for example, when I bred for the lean pig that was rapidly growing, they also bred for an excitable, nasty, fighting, mean pig. Now nobody deliberately went out and bred a mean pig but sometimes uh, genetics can kind of uh, throw you a curveball. You know, some of the laying hens are very flighty and excitable and cannibalistic, and a lot of, there's, a, there's a large uh, genetic component to that. You say, in fact, that a lot of people who work in the livestock industry, an industry that has uh, a very high turnover rate, 
aren't really equipped emotionally to work in that field. Um, some are actually sadistic. Well, what I have found about stockmanship, you know, this is the people that day to day take care of animals. First of all, you cannot understaff and overload people and equipment. That they absolutely you can't do that. And what I have found about some stockmanship, something like cattle handling, being a good dairyman, there's about 20% of people that are really temperamentally into always, you know, being quiet around cattle and kind of really understand them. And there's about 20% that just shouldn't be there. They like to hurt them, and they just should not be there. And, and can that, we weed them out? Yeah, I think they need to be fired. I hate to say that. Some people think I'm real hard-nosed about that, but I've been around for a long time. And when I was working on construction back in the 80s and the 70s and 80s all the time out working on construction, I saw people just, you know, construction workers, it's like you're not there. They do, you know, I was just a little nobody, and uh, they did all kinds of bad things because construction workers sort of just weren't there. And, and those people just shouldn't be working with animals. What do you make of the animal rights movement of, of PETA, for example? Well, there's been exposés of really bad things, like that horrible Westland Hallmark place where they were torturing dairy cows with a forklift, uh, people beating pigs up with gate rods. Yeah, you expose those kind of abuses. Yeah, that needs to be cleaned up. You know, but then you get into the issue of whether or not you know, we should use animals for food. And um, I have the physiology that if I don't eat animal products, I get so lightheaded, I cannot function. Um, I can't eat soy products because it's gonna, I've got Meniere's disease, which is autoimmune, it flares that up, makes that a whole lot worse. Uh, but we've got to treat animals right. We've got to give that, those animals a, a decent life. And in fact, you say uh, death is not the worst thing for a livestock animal. It's the quality of their we've lives. Got to, you know, we've got to look more at quality of life. And there are some animals that definitely don't, do not have a good quality of life. And of all the animals, beef, when they're done right, probably has the best quality of life. People assume, because of your work, that, that you might be a vegetarian. Well, when I was in college, when I was in graduate school, I went through all the business about trying to give up meat. And first of all, I couldn't do it. And there are some people that just, um, my mother's got the same metabolism. If I don't eat a certain amount of animal protein, and dairy just doesn't quite do it. Uh, I get so lightheaded I cannot function. I think a number of people have wondered if, if Temple Grandin put her resources, her knowledge, her know-how into improving human systems, I wonder what they'd look like. And I wonder if you've ever been interested in reforming the way a prison works or a subway system or other human systems. Well, one of the problems, I go in airports all the time, and one of the problems you have, and I've looked at airports lots of time from a design standpoint, is they get added on hodgepodge. The other problem that you have with airports is the airport has to keep operating while they're adding on to it. So you get a lot of kind of hodgepodgey things, and then you get a terminal that's built from scratch, like Denver or Atlanta, uh, those are laid out, you know, a whole lot better than than a, a mess like Kennedy, for example. Um, you know, prisons, we need to be working on uh, keeping the people out of there. If you could uh, change one practice or give one single bit of advice to a parent raising a child somewhere on the autism spectrum, what advice would you give? I have to qualify that by age. Okay, starting with real little kids, the two and three year olds. They've got to get 20 or 30 hours a week of one-to-ones taught with a really, really great teacher. We need to be teaching the turn-taking, uh, manners, uh, mismanners meals. Um, we've got to put a lot of effort into those little ones. Okay, now we get into older kids, so kind of we're going to branch off into the ones that might be able to go more the kind of route I've gone and the ones where it, it is not going to be, they're not going to go to college. They're, they're just not going to be able to do it. The ones that are more like me, we need to be developing that area of strength. If it's visual thinker, you know, artwork, uh, graphic design, industrial design. What I do, cattle handling equipment, that's industrial design. See, when you have a product like an iPod, um, the industrial designer designed the outside and sort of all the pretty way that it worked, the engineers had to make the innards and make it work. Or if it's a math mind or the word mind, uh, mentors, really, really, really important. Okay, you have somebody that's a little lower down on the spectrum. Uh, well, we got to teach them, you know, daily living skills. Uh, uh, take them out and get them doing a lot of different things. I think one thing that's important for everybody, we got to expose these people to a lot of different things. They resist change. Just remember, no surprises. Mother made me go out to the ranch, and I'm glad she did. But I knew about it three months in advance, and I had pictures, and you know, I was able to prepare myself to, to go. 
And what advice for the neurotypicals out there, living in a world where there are a growing number of people with autism? Well, one of the things about working with somebody that's on the spectrum is they need really clear details of the outcome of work. Okay, let's say you hired the person as a programmer. Don't just say something vague like develop new software. Tell them some very specific outcome you want, like it's use a certain amount of memory done in this code. Don't tell them how to do it exactly. It has to have a very specific outcome. And the problem is neurotypicals tend to be way too vague in how they give instructions. Also, you know, when they do good work, praise them. Uh, don't take advantage of your Asperger employee. But you'll have a really good employee if you just uh, you know, give them lots of interesting things to do. But there's got to be a specific outcome, not just vague, uh, something vague like develop new products. I'd like to just close with, with your thoughts on, on what the future is for those on the spectrum. Are we getting better at addressing their needs? Well, of course, one of the problems we've got is diagnosis is not precise. And I just recently went to the American Psychi Psychiatric Association website. They have now put up summaries of some of the meetings on for the DMS-5. And they're talk looking at like making the whole thing the autistic spectrum with very vague, uh, I didn't see anything in there about speech delay. So what is an autism diagnosis? I can't wait until we can go to high speed brain scanning where we can just go in the brain and, and, and pinpoint exactly where the problem is. Okay, this person's got not hearing hard consonant sounds. This is one of the problems I had. Or this person's gonna have a sound sensitivity problem. Or this one's gonna have a problem with speech output. Um, this one, the emotional circuits are all messed up, so we need to work on social skills where we can kind of figure out where the problem is in the brain. Because the problem with a diagnosis like autism, and it's going to be even more vague now if they end up making the DMS-5, like what I read on the website, uh, is you've got so many apples and oranges all mixed together. Because just look at the medication things. And there's way too many powerful medications given out to little kids. And again, though, you see the value in the picture. To, yeah. to be able to show us. Thank you, uh, Temple Grandin, so much for talking with us. Well, thank you for having me. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Temple Grandin. If you'd like to learn more about her life and advocacy and her work with animals, or see additional material from our interview, visit us online at conversations.psu.edu. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you for our next conversation. Production funding provided in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Thank you. This has been a production of WPSU. A copy of the program you've just seen can be purchased through Penn State Media Sales at mediasales.psu.edu or by calling 800-770-2111.